have the uh, keynote bird of birds. Um, he's the uh, independent uh, programmer. He works a lot doing stuff for viewpoints and works with Alan. And somebody told me that he has all the versions of Smoto. And if you want to see Smoto 72 running, just he's a guy. Okay? Is that true? Almost, Almost. Yeah, yeah. I know where to see it running, yeah. <laughs> okay, does so it sound okay for everybody? Yeah? Okay, so my talk is about Squeak.js, which is just a Squeak, a small talk that's running um, in the web browser. Um, and there have been lots of... Um, attempts to do that, and uh, there are projects uh, that have brought Smalltalk to the web. Uh, the difference here is that Squeak.js is a real Smalltalk. Um, what do I mean by real Smalltalk? Um, for example, something like large integers. So many of the Smalltalk-like implementations on the web, uh, they compile to JavaScript, obviously, um, but then they just use the JavaScript numbers. Um, and then that means that, yeah, down, yeah, better, okay, good. Um, that means that if you want to calculate 100 factorial, you end up with a float number, and if you want to do a thousand factorial, it just gets to infinity, which is not fun. That's one of the nicer uh, properties of small talk that we have actual integers that are only limited by the available memory, right? Um, then there's something that's really good for metaprogramming is I want to get all the instances of my class. I want to migrate them. Uh, that's what you need uh, to support for become. So you need to find all instances, and then you do a bulk become from the old instance layout to the new instance layout. Um, you want to have something like weak references and finalization in particular. Um, which means that you can actually detect when something gets finalized and then run some code to clean up. Um, recently, JavaScript added weak maps to the JavaScript language, but you cannot enumerate them. So it's basically useless for, for our purposes. Uh, you can add, uh, basically you can only look up something, you can give it a key and you get a value back if you put the value before but you cannot iterate over all the keys, which to me doesn't make much sense as a small talker, but there you go. Um, then we have something like this context. Um, and nobody really, so most people don't actually use this context and manipulate it, but behind the scenes, having full context objects is what gives you resumable exceptions. That is, whenever a debugger pops up, you just change the code, you say, continue running, that's what this gives you um, as a power. Um, and so Squeak.js does all that, and because it does all that faithfully, it can run actual Squeak image. It can just take a Squeak image, run it in the web browser. Bit identical, that's what Dan Ingalls um, uh, promised back in the day with the first Squeak paper in 1997, uh, I think it was published, might have been 96, um, that you have a, an environment that has all your classes, all your personal tools, everything, and you can take it from one machine to another machine, and it just works. And now we have another platform where it just works. Um, so let me get into some details. Um, Oh, Hanan. <laughs> yeah, tweet at me and we'll pop up here. <laughs> um, does that go away? No? Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, so in the native Squeak VM, um, uh, what we have is really just bits in memory. You have an image file, which is a snapshot. It's a memory dump. So Squeak starts up very quickly by just taking that image file, putting it up in memory, and then continue running where it left off. Um, 
in Squeak.js, I chose to use actually the, the features of having a high level language. So JavaScript itself, it's an object oriented language, it's, uh, it's dynamic, and um, it, the implementations are pretty efficient by now, mostly because there's actually small talk people working on the VMs. Yeah, V8 is, uh, was created by an old small talker. Um, and so behind the scenes, it actually converts all the code in, in something that looks a lot like Smalltalk and not a lot like JavaScript. Um, and so using these, the, uh, the JavaScript objects and um, using their garbage collector and using uh, as many features of the host language as, uh, as possible um, makes for a better efficiency. Yeah, so I'm trying to use as much of JavaScript as I can, but I'm not cheating um, on the semantics. So I'm keeping the full Smalltalk semantics, and so that's a tightrope to walk. Um, so let me show you a little bit uh, of that. So this is um, this is actually running the lively kernel, which uh, is Dan Ingle's JavaScript environment. That's uh, Smalltalk-like. So and I made a little uh, debugger in here. And so what you can do is you just take some image. I'm going to take a mini image. So it loaded the image. Whoop, there it is. And uh, we can see that the VM knows actually not that much about the image. The VM knows there's a special objects array, which is put in a special slot somewhere in the image. And then there's the active context, which is the context that was used to snapshot the image. And so these two objects are the main objects the VM needs to know about. Um, and then if we walk up the context sender chain, so there's a sender, there's a sender, there's a sender, there's a sender, that's these um, method contexts here. Yeah? So we are in the... Uh, <laughs> We are in the uh, snapshot and quit method. Let me sit down. So we are in the snapshot and quit method. We have a context object, which is this, uh, this object over here, active context, um, which currently has 11, no, it has uh, like six, one, two, three, four, five, uh, six, seven um, objects in it. Um, and what's on the top of the stack, so I call it top of the stack, but it's uh, listed on the bottom, um, is the true value, which is what the VM, where are we? Oops, here we are. Uh, which is what the supposed return value from the snapshot primitive is. So the VM puts a true on the stack when it starts up at an image, whereas if you just invoke the snapshot primitive without quitting, it returns a false. That's how the image determines if it can actually, if it's a cold start or if it's a warm start. And then uh, we have a bytecode, 8142 hexadecimal, and I can just execute this bytecode, stepping. It's going to store this into the temp number two, which currently is nil. Yeah, temp number two is till, is nil. You can step over it, and now temp number two is true, and that's also over here. Can you guys see that? Actually, uh, yeah, it's okay. Good. Um, and this is actually fun. Um, so now it's going to execute the jump instructions to bytecode number seventy-two. That's down there. Um, where am I? Here. I think my scrolling code uh, didn't take into account the scaling. That's why it's not. Uh, jumping where I wanted to jump, but we are at the pop instruction, so this true is going to be popped off the stack. Uh, so step, and it's gone. Yeah, and I can also just say, okay, continue. We have a little over thing here. Uh, over, over, over. What's what's it doing? Where are we? It's going to send. It's, yeah, all that stuff, and then it's going to start to process the startup list and all these things. Uh, let me try to step into one of these. Okay, so we're in the true uh, and thing, and the implementation of and in true is just return whatever is passed as an argument, right? So it's going to push that, and it's going to pop it off the stack, and now that's the return value. So, and when I press continue, 
then it actually runs. And this is hard to read for some reason. Um, so I will not show it here, but maybe in another instance of Squeak.js. So this is Squeak.js if you go to the website. Uh, there's the mini image that you can launch. Yes, okay. Starting menu, yeah, that's more readable. Um, and you can do something like 100 factorial, which is this, right? Um, so that works. Uh, you can do graphics all day long if you want to. So this is an actual squeak running here in the web browser. Yeah, this is Chrome. It works best in Chrome, uh, so copy-paste, uh, that stuff works uh, best um, in Chrome. It also works in Firefox, it also works in um, Safari, it even works on the iPad. Um, so it's Squeak.js, learning, loading, there it is. And I can say, okay, here, 100 factorial, it's a bit fiddly. The interface wasn't made for touch, obviously, um, but you can press the little button here and then actually type stuff. And, yeah. Um, that keyboard button does not work on Android, um, but all the code is on GitHub, so pull requests are very welcome. Someone wants to work on that. Um, um, yeah, so maybe that's about the object memory. I can, uh, oh, one more thing. Um, so this object here, this active context, uh, is a JavaScript object, so if I inspect this using the lively tools, I can see this is what it actually looks like. Um, so it's a JavaScript object that has a couple fields. In particular, it has a pointer to the class, which is just another object. Um, it has an oop, which currently is negative, and that indicates that it's a, a new oop. It's in, in my new space. Um, it has an identity hash, and currently it's marked dirty. Uh, we get to that later. Um, and all the fields of this object are the pointers. So this is a context. It has 22 slots. Um, they're all here. Um, and in slot 0, there is, OK, that's the sender. And slot 1, there's a nil in there. But nil, again, is a real object here. Uh, which has an additional field that's called isNeil. I use that for quick isNeil testing. Um, I could also, like on newer VMs, it's guaranteed that the OOP is, is uh, 4, so my, I might check for the OOP, but I don't. It's not hard-coded. Um, and then what you see here, this one, that's actually a number. Yeah. So what um, what I'm doing is the same thing that the Squeak VM is doing is using tagged integers, uh, except I'm not tagging it. Uh, so the, the Squeak VM uses pointers that have the lowest bit set. So it's an odd pointer. It's not a valid pointer to mark an integer of 30 bits, uh, 31 bits. Uh, so the, the word is 32 bits. You have one tag bit. And then there's 31 bits that you can use for numbers. Um, and what I'm doing is I use JavaScript numbers for small integers, and I have a type of test in there. So instead of testing a tag bit, I look at it. Is this an object? Yes, then it's a full object. Otherwise, if it's a number, then it's, an, it's a small integer. Um, whereas a float, for example, is, is still a real object. So it's a full, fully allocated object. Um, I need that to track something like 0.0, .0 as a float. So Smalltalk relies on 0.0, .0 being recognized as a float, whereas in JavaScript, there's only one number type. They only have floats. So there's no distinction between 0.0, .0 the float, and 0, the integer. Um, if there are any questions anytime, I'm happy to answer. Um, otherwise, I'll, yeah? Yes, I have a question. Uh, yeah. um, so basically, it is. Is the uh, VM that we wrote in JavaScript? Yes. Right? So how do we use the JavaScript to download the browser? Uh, let me sign out. Oops. 
Um, where are we? Screeches. Okay, so the actual VM is 400k of code, and I could do um, a line count. So the VM is 8,000 lines. Uh, Squeak.js is the wrapper around that, which does all the input-output, like the displaying and the loading of images and that stuff. Uh, the JIT compiler, which I come to later, is just 800 lines right now. Um, plus, okay, I'm lying, there are, there are a couple of plugins. Um, okay, so that's another 30,000 lines and plugins. And most of them are generated from the uh, slang code. So the Squeak VM is mostly implemented in Squeak itself using a subset of Squeak called slang. And so normally from that small talk code, C code gets generated. But I rewrote that um, the translator from small talk to C to actually generate JavaScript. It's a big, ugly hack, I admit, but it works. So. Mm -hmm. No, that's only for the plugins. The, the VM core, the interpreter, is handwritten. Okay. But a, a lot of the plugins, like especially the Bitlet plugin, which has 4,700 lines of code, and I wrote that by hand first and tried to get the semantics exactly right. I couldn't. Um, so there are like so many bitlet modes, and they are so subtle, and they depend on the C semantics for bit shift, and I, I don't know. Uh, so it's a lot. Um, so it worked a lot better after I generated it. Um, yeah. And there's also two or three handwritten plugins here, like the socket plugin that's a, um, a contribution by, by, uh, by a student, um, and they felt more comfortable to put those plugins in a separate file. Whereas in vm.js, there are also the, the built-in plugins are in the vm.js file. And the source code layout is a little bit weird for someone who knows JavaScript um, because when I'm doing it in the lively kernel, um, I'm seeing the VM here. So it's one big file, but it has these classes in it. And if you scroll down here, that's, that's a lot. It's, it's not nice to, to look at if you're looking at it in a, in a file browser. But if you're looking at it using the lively tools, then yeah, you have your car garbage collection, you have your partial garbage collection, it's all fine, right? So that's the... Um, the beauty of doing that in a, in a live coding system. Um, yeah. Could you implement support for the implement support for FFI? I do not support FFI right now. Um, the, uh, it wouldn't be hard to support FFI. What would be hard is emulating the C libraries. Right. Because FFI is calling into C, and basically you, you have no idea what C library a particular image will load. And so uh, in Squeak, we do not include FFI by default. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is that we do not want anything in the base system to depend on FFI. Right. So because what the virtual machine gives you is a clean surface between the small talk world and the outside world. So you only have primitives, and the only way to talk to the outside world is primitives. And so if you implement all the primitives, your image doesn't even know it's running anywhere or somewhere specific, right? If you do FFI, then that widens the surface of your VM immensely because uh, all of a sudden you have the, the whole C library operating system. What uh, I'm just explaining for the others. So, um, so that's why... Uh, so right now there's no FFI. Um, we do have a JavaScript bridge. I'm going to come to that better uh, later. Um, and I already spoke half an hour, I guess. So let's continue. <laughs> um, the garbage collector, um, as I said, uh, I want to reuse the JavaScript garbage collector. Um, and that would all be fine, because all the objects are just pointing to each other. right? Um, and so when there is no reference to one object, it would just get eaten by the JavaScript garbage collector. Except 
sometimes we need to enumerate all our objects. Yeah, so object enumeration is the big thing which we need for become, we need for all instances, all objects, all the fun stuff. And so um, what I did at first, no, so somehow you have to, to implement that. Uh, basically, Squeak has a next object primitive. So from one object, you need to get to the next object. And in C, it just walks the entire address space and it just goes, 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 It's very fast, very efficient. Um, uh, also, in Spur, Elliot changed that because for him in Spur, it's harder. So he has a new primitive called all objects, which just gives back an array of all the objects. So that's somewhat uh, simpler. Um, or all instances, which gives back an array. But there's a fallback code. If those uh, primitives are not implemented, it falls back to the object enumeration. Um, so what I came up with is that my old space is a linked list. So when I'm loading in an image, all the objects get a next object pointer. And so enumerating those old objects is very cheap. Yeah, so my primitive just takes the object and returns the next object pointer. Easy. Problem is um, when we get to new space. So when I'm allocating an object, I cannot put it onto that linked list because if I put it onto the linked list, it wouldn't get garbage collected. So instead, these objects just hang in the air. And when we actually need to enumerate the objects, I'm doing a full GC. So I'm basically I'm walking to the end of, uh, of the old space. And then at the last old object, I somehow have to continue with the new object. So then I do a full garbage collection which appends all the live new objects to the old space, and then I continue to walk that list. Yeah? This is expensive. Um, so for, a, for an object memory, like a squeak 5.1 object memory with I don't know how many hundred thousand objects, that takes half a second, the full GC. Um, and I lived with that for a while until I got too annoyed and I got something new. Um, so now I have something that I call young space, uh, which is another linked list uh, of uh, of the new in new space um, that is only temporary. So it's not actually appended to the old space list. It's an, another new space list. Uh, it's another linked list. Um, and the question is, how can I actually get the the new objects into that list. And I do that by basically doing a write barrier. So whenever an object is stored in another object, I mark that object dirty. And so to find all the roots for my new space, I just have to walk the old space list, look at the dirty flag, and that's the roots for my heap walk. And that gets me a factor of 10 speed up. So now my partial GC is only 50 milliseconds, which is still not great, but it's, it's a lot better because every become, every uh, all instances or so needs that, uh, needs that primitive. So they became faster by 50%. Yeah? When and how do you the, the old space? Oh, when I do a full GC, uh, then the unreachable old object get unlinked from that list. The JavaScript GC gives you a list of no, no, no. private objects? Or no. Um, so old space stays the same. So partial GC doesn't deal with old space. Only when I do a full GC, then I basically uh, do a full tree walk from the object roots, which is uh, active context and special objects array. So that's a full tree walk. All objects get marked. And then I walk the old space list and look at any unmarked objects. And these get unlinked. So you, you implemented that full GC in so JavaScript? Yeah. So the full GC is, is, in Java, is implemented by me, yes. So mark is just a flag. Yeah. And so objects are not bits in an image are JavaScript objects. Objects are real JavaScript objects, yes. Both in the old space and in the... Yeah. In the new, new space, yes. So the object gets created in new space, 
and then maybe it gets appended to all space if it survives. Um, and that scheme also supports weak references. So, this is the compatibility You don't have this. How do you solve that? The image cannot tell. Yeah, I can save images and Spur can load them. And yeah, I can take uh, them. Uh, no, I'm generating. Yeah. When I load the image, I generate JavaScript objects. And when I save the images, image, I generate bits. It's not very fast. So loading an image takes some seconds uh, because it's creating all the objects. Um, so it's a lot slower than the CVM. Um, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, did you say that you have to scan all space to find the objects that refer to young space? Did I hear you right? Yes. The, that's my partial GC. And you consider those objects in Yes, if JavaScript had real weak maps, that would work. Oh, so that's the issue. That's the issue. Because if I if I put all the new objects into an array, then they will never get garbage collected. No, we're not the old ones that have reference to new Um that would work too, yes, instead of adding a bit. Um, yes, yes, agreed, agreed. Um, I should explore that. Um, the, the thing is, um, adding that object to, to another, okay, here's the thing. Um, JavaScript does not have an identity dictionary. Um, so, to even add that thing to a dictionary, you need some ID, which is okay because I have an OOP um, that I can use as a, as a key um, to put it into a regular dictionary. Um, and that might be, a, might be a good idea. Yes, agreed. Um, the, for me, the, the bit was uh, easier to implement because at all the stores, I just have to set that bit in the object Whereas with the other thing, I would have to pass around my remembered set everywhere, so I have access to it. Okay. Okay. I think performance-wise, it would come out as a wash. That's that's my hunch, but I haven't haven't tried it yet. Walking the old space is actually pretty fast. Um, okay. So much for the for that. Uh, the interpreter. Um, is what I started with. It has a byte per loop, um, which is really pretty much what you expect. So it fetches the next byte, and then, oops, it has a big switch statement, and depending on what the bytecode is, it does the operation. So it pushes the receiver, so that's the load receiver variable, load temporaries, load literals. So for the literal, it pushes the current methods and literal onto, this, uh, onto the stack. That's it. It's very, very simple. Um, this here is a little interesting thing because I actually have two switch statements of 128 cases each. And the reason for that is that in Chrome, if, if a method contains a switch statement that has more than 128 cases, it gets deoptimized. You don't want to get your inner bytecode loop to get deoptimized. No. So I split it in two, I reported the bug to Chrome, um, and they actually fixed it because they had that limit in there for ages and nobody bothered to update it. Really, I, I think they might even just remove that check. So in current Chrome, this isn't necessary anymore, but doesn't hurt either. So I left it in there. Um, yeah, so these are all the bytecodes. Um, what's more interesting, maybe, is the thing at the very top here, um, which is saying, okay, so if this method is compiled, 
then we call this method dot compiled, which is a function. So that's what my JIT compiler does. Um, and I can show you that thing. Um, so this change to green, if you remember, uh, it was yellow before, the, the highlight was yellow. Now it's green, which uh, is my way of saying, okay, this method actually was compiled. Um, so if I inspect this method here, so it's this, um, then we have method is the third pointer. So here, that's my method. And so if I say this, this dot compiled, that's actually the generated code for this method. So you can see uh, it's a push self, it's a send prim mouse buttons, the push const seven, bit end and return top of stack. And that's the uh, compiled version for that, which is a wild true switch case. Um, that's because JavaScript does not have a go-to. I need to have a go-to to jump back to some statement. So what I do is I have a switch of the PC, uh, the program counter, and so when I need to jump, I don't have to jump in this here, I think. But then it's just a break to, not a break, it's a continue, and so then it jumps to the PC and jump, boom, 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 boom. So, um, this is not very efficient, but it gets rid of the bytecode decoding step. And so it's actually a, a big improvement over the interpreter. What I really want to have time for is make this generate good JavaScript code, where it actually calls another JavaScript function for the next method. Because what's really slow is message, message sends for me. A message send, um, do we have one in here? Nope. Um, uh, just for curiosity, the, the previous uh, code that you showed had those big switch statements. And you were wondering, well, you can think of any cases. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, did you try, and, and this is out of my own curiosity, did, did you try taking the Bible uh, and how now, like 256? Bytes to 256 types of bytes. So, for instance, all the little literals that you have, like, mm -hmm. you know, you would be able to mess with one type. Yes, then do a switch on the type, which then would have less cases and perhaps only one switch type. I have. We've not tried that. Okay. No. Um, yeah, so this is my uh, JIT compiler right now. Um, a send is. Um, it's hard um, be, because I'm actually allocating a full context for each send, so I do the method lookup. I do have a little method cache in there, the, the lookup cache, but still, uh, to actually execute that send, I allocate a new context, and then I do a context switch to that context, um, and that's when this active context here changes. Yeah, so that's, that's the object. And so that's, um, that's actually pretty slow. Um, if you can see here my tiny benchmarks, um, depending on what machine you're running it on, um, so this one has 80,000 bytecodes per second and 1.7 million cents per second. Um, I'm sure with a better JIT compiler, um, that could be a factor of 10 improved at least. Um, but it's actually fast enough for, for a lot of things. Um, okay, back to my slides. Where are we? Sense, full context, okay. Okay, that's that. JIT compiler. We did that. Did that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so we have a little bit more. Oh, so fun things uh, you can do with that um, is, for example, the JavaScript bridge. So, if I'm doing this here. All screen on. Uh, I hope that works. Okay. 
Okay. So it's loading my JavaScript bridge. Demo. Oh, actually, I don't want that. Uh, I don't want it to be in full screen. Where are we? Why is it still in full screen? I don't know. Anyway, so you can actually um, just call. Uh, so I have a global called JS, which is a class. Uh, no, it's a it's a global object. It's a JavaScript proxy. So if I do that, um, I can do an alert. Yeah? So that's calling JavaScript code. Uh, the syntax is pretty much exactly the same as Ember, uh, Ember Smalltalk. And so I can if I send a unary message to JS, it does a lookup of that symbol. So that would be console.log squeak says hello world. And so if I open the console here, clear, and then say hello world, squeak says hello world. And it just did a partial GC because in this old image, every evaluate does a become. Not really sure why, but every compiler call uh, does it a little become. Um, so we can do JavaScript code. Um, we can, okay, go away. Restore this plane. We can create objects. We can add a new function. So this is just a new function call here. Yeah. Um, so if I execute this, it actually calculated the um, this complex prop plus this complex prop dot b, which turns out to be seven, three plus four, in a very very complicated way. Um, and we can inspect this. So there's an inspector on the JS window object. So it has a couple globals. That's all the JavaScript public uh, global objects. Yeah. Lots of stuff in there. Um, what else? Uh, one interesting thing is that you can add a block, and that becomes a JavaScript function. So I just uh, said transcript show this call. So I'm going to open a transcript. And so when I say JavaScript eval this JavaScript function, it actually called my squeak function. So that's how you can um, call into or call from JavaScript into squeak.js. Um, and then there's silly things like doing jQuery, jQuery. Uh, and I can say, OK, just <laughs> hide slowly and show fast. Yeah, so that's a jQuery thing. So that took my canvas and just manipulated the HTML there. Um, OK. Good enough for now. Um, so that's the JavaScript bridge. And then there's re some really interesting th stuff that I don't have time to show. Um, so Craig Letter is using Squeak.js. Um, his blog is at thiscontext.com. Um, and what he's using for Tether is you run your Squeak application in Squeak.js, so all your client or your whatever customer needs is a link, so they click on the link. It opens a web page which runs Squeak.js and your application, you can actually try it before you buy it, so to say. Um, then he has an, an install button inside of Squeak.js which downloads the VM for your platform that your browser is uh, running on onto your machine. So it might be a Mac VM, a Linux VM, a Windows VM. Um, then it saves the image that's running in Squeak.js to your downloads folder, runs the VM using that image, and then that image notices, oh, I'm, um, I'm running natively. I'm not running in Squeak.js. So I'm opening a WebSocket connection. And then the JavaScript image talks to that image in the fast VM via this WebSocket connection and basically redirects the, the display into the web browser, Squeak.js, so that all of a sudden everything becomes way faster. 
So that's a very cool demo. That's a very cool demo. Go to thiscontext.com. Uh, Craig has that stuff there. Um, I'm still working in Ellen Kay's group with Dan Ingalls and Yoshiki Oshima and uh, most of the others that are there. And uh, one thing we're using uh, SqueakJS for is doing a tutoring system where you have a learner's computer and a teacher's computer, and the teacher can watch what the learner is doing, the student is doing, um, and that's also working via WebSockets and um, doing, uh, using it with eToys. Um, there's a cool speech plugin. Um, I couldn't actually download the image because the internet is a little bit slow here, um, so it's big, but it's actually linked on the, on the website. Um, oops. If you go to, where are we? If you go to SqueakJS, um, to the website, um, you go to the launcher page, and then in the launcher there's the speech plugin demo, uh, which actually uses the web speech API so you can voice control your Squeak image. You can say, open a browser, and the browser pops up. And then uh, it's fun stuff. And the students had uh, fun working on that because implementing a plugin in Squeak.js is, turns out to actually be a lot easier for them than the, the regular Squeak C VM plugins. So that was interesting. Um, and yeah, so you can try it at squeakjs.org. Uh, it's a GitHub repository for the code. And I also want to say 20 years of Squeak this month. Oh, and by the way, this presentation here, of course, that's running in, in Squeak.js. So uh, that's actually an eToys image. And uh, if I get out of full screen, oops, it's over here. I'm not sure why the scaling is wrong right now. Ah, that's because the, the screen is big here. So yeah, so it's actually inside, it's running inside this web page. Yeah, so, and uh, uh, I guess I cannot even reach the button to go full screen anymore. Uh, wait. Oh. <laughs> I pressed command dot. Uh, I wanted to press command comma. Yeah, and it's unreadable. Okay. Uh, I don't know. I think it has problems with the with the screen size here. Oh, there we go. Yeah. So it runs eToys, it runs Scratch, it runs Spur images. So it, I, right now I can, you can take pretty much any Squeak file, Squeak image from your disk and drop it into this window and it will run. Yeah. So, okay, questions, yeah? Questions? I, I have a question. Uh, could you show me how much memory Chrome is using or is um, yeah. Um, okay, we'll slow details. Um, do you know where I see the memory? Maybe on the activity monitor. Activity monitor. Oh, the activity monitor. Uh, oh, I can do the this this the Chrome thing. So, hey. Okay, so my Etos JS tab has 500 megabytes right now. So that's probably a factor of 10 to running natively. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, if you if you t uh, try to do it in, inside here, so that's the Chrome debugger tool, right? So you can do squeakjs dot vm. That's the current um, currently running vm, and it probably has an active context, and that's the method context, and you can look inside there. Um, I played around a little bit with uh, named prototypes in JavaScript so that you actually get a nice debug output here. 
So you see there's a nil in there, a nil, a compiled method. There's a true. I couldn't use true as a name because that's a reserved word in, in um, JavaScript. Yeah. So you can even debug using this. But uh, this debugger is a lot nicer. And the editor is using the HTML number, so is it uh, so the etoys image is unmodified. Um, maybe I have changed one or two preferences there. Um, what Squeak.js is doing, it's creating a canvas HTML element on the web page, and then basically the display driver inside the VM uh, is using bitlet, um, the show bits primitive, um, which transfers bits from the display bitmap in Squeak to that canvas. And so it's using put pixel data, I think, to draw onto the canvas. So there, there's no HTML rendering code at all in, in Squeak. It's all bits, it's, uh, just bitmaps. Okay. Well, thank you very much. All right. <laughs>